Son tried to kick me out of my own home because he wanted to start a family and buy a big house in another community. I'm a 65 M who's been a single father for the past 32 years. My wife, Laura, passed away when our son, Gary, was just three years old. It was a sudden and devastating loss, she was in a car accident on her way home from work. One moment we were a happy family of three, and the next, I was left alone to raise our little boy. Those early years were incredibly tough. I was working as a high school English teacher at the time, and suddenly I had to juggle my job with being a full-time parent. There were nights when I'd sit on the floor of Gary's room, watching him sleep, wondering how I was going to manage it all. But somehow, day by day, we made it work. I made a lot of sacrifices over the years. I turned down promotions that would have required longer hours of travel. I missed out on social events and dating opportunities because Gary always came first. But I never resented it. Gary was my world, and seeing him grow into a happy, healthy young man made it all worthwhile. As Gary got older, things got easier in some ways and harder in others. The practical challenges of raising a child lessened, but the emotional ones intensified. Gary started asking more questions about his mother, and I did my best to keep her memory alive for him. We'd look at photo albums together, and I'd tell him stories about her. It was bittersweet, but I wanted him to know how much she had loved him. Despite the challenges, Gary and I had a great relationship. We were more than just father and son, we were best friends. We shared a love of sports, particularly baseball, and some of my fondest memories are of teaching Gary to pitch in our backyard. As he got older, we'd spend weekends hiking or camping. I was so proud when Gary got accepted into a good college. It was bittersweet watching him pack up for his dorm room. But I was excited for him to start this new chapter of his life. We stayed in close contact during his college years. He'd call me for advice on everything from his classes to girl troubles, and I'd cherish those conversations. After college, Gary moved back home while he looked for a job. It was during this time that he met Jane. She was smart, beautiful, and came from a wealthy family. At first, I was happy that Gary had found someone who made him so happy. But as time went on, I started to notice changes in Gary's behavior. He became more focused on material things, always talking about the fancy restaurants Jane took him to or the expensive gifts her parents bought. I tried not to let it bother me, reminding myself that Gary was a grown man and entitled to live his life how he chose. But I couldn't shake the feeling that he was changing into someone I didn't recognize. When Gary announced that he and Jane were getting married, I was happy for them, even if I had my concerns. I offered to help with the wedding expenses, but Gary insisted that Jane's parents were covering everything. The wedding was a lavish affair, far more extravagant than anything our family was used to. I felt out of place among Jane's family and friends, but I put on a brave face for Gary's sake. After the wedding, Gary and Jane moved into a beautiful house in an upscale neighborhood. It was a stark contrast to the modest home Gary had grown up in. I was invited over for dinner occasionally, but I always felt like an outsider in their modern home. Jane was polite but distant, and I couldn't help but feel that she saw me as an embarrassment. As the years went by, I saw less and less of Gary. He was busy with his high-powered job and his new lifestyle. When we did talk, our conversations felt superficial. I missed my son, but I told myself that this was a natural part of growing up and starting a new family. Then, about six months ago, I made a decision that would change everything. I decided to retire from teaching. I was 65, and after 40 years in the classroom, I felt it was time. I was looking forward to having more free time, maybe doing some traveling or taking up new hobbies. When I told Gary about my decision to retire, his reaction surprised me. Instead of being happy for me, he seemed concerned. He asked about my financial situation, wanting to know if I had enough saved up. I assured him that I had been careful with my money over the years and had a decent pension. I wasn't rich by any means, but I had enough to live comfortably. That's when Gary suggested that I sell my house and move in with him and Jane. At first, I was touched by the offer. I thought it was a sign that Gary wanted to reconnect, to have me be a bigger part of his life again. But then he started talking about how much my house was worth and how the money from the sale could help us all out. I loved my house. It was where I had raised Gary, where we had made so many memories together. The thought of selling it had never crossed my mind. I told Gary I appreciated the offer but that I was happy where I was. He seemed disappointed but didn't push the issue. Over the next few weeks, Gary started calling more often. Each time, he would bring up the idea of me selling the house. He talked about how I could contribute to their household, how it would be a win-win for everyone. I started to feel uncomfortable with his persistence. Then, about a month after I retired, Gary and Jane showed up at my house unannounced. They said they wanted to talk about my living situation. Jane did most of the talking, explaining how they were planning to start a family soon and how wonderful it would be to have me there to help with the grandchildren. But something about her tone felt off. It was like she was trying to sell me something. As the conversation went on, it became clear what they really wanted. They had their eye on a bigger house in an even more exclusive neighborhood, but they needed more money for the down payment. They thought that if I sold my house and moved in with them, I could invest the money in their new home, 
In return, I would have a room in their house and be part of their family. It felt like they were trying to manipulate me, using the promise of family closeness to get their hands on my money. I told them firmly that I had no intention of selling my house or investing in theirs. Gary looked angry, but Jane kept her composure, saying they were just trying to help me. After they left, I felt shaken. I couldn't believe my son, the little boy I had raised on my own, would try to pressure me like this. I spent the next few days thinking about our relationship, trying to pinpoint when things had gone so wrong. A week later, Gary called. His tone was different this time. He said that since I wasn't willing to be reasonable, they had no choice but to take matters into their own hands. He informed me that the house I was living in was actually in his name. I had bought the house when Gary was still a child, but I remembered putting it in both our names when he turned 18. I thought it was a way to secure his future, never imagining he would use it against me. Gary said that as the co-owner, he had the right to sell the house, and he intended to do just that. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My own son was threatening to sell the roof over my head. When I protested, saying this was my home, Gary's response was you're retired now, dad, he said. You're just a useless old man. Jane and I have our future to think about. The next few weeks were a nightmare. Gary and Jane started showing up with real estate agents, insisting on giving tours of the house. They ignored my protests, acting as if I wasn't even there. I felt like a ghost in my own home, watching strangers walk through rooms. One day, I overheard Jane talking to Gary in the kitchen. She didn't realize I was in the next room. We need to get that useless old bones out of here, she said. I can't believe you let him freeload for so long. Gary's response was equally hurtful. Don't worry, we'll get rid of him soon. He's had his time, now it's our turn. I was devastated. The son I had sacrificed everything for now saw me as nothing more than a burden. I felt lost and alone, unsure of what to do next. That's where I find myself now. My son and daughter-in-law are actively trying to sell my home out from under me. They've made it clear that they see me as nothing more than a useless old bone standing in the way of their plans. I'm hurt, angry, and scared about my future. I never imagined I'd be in this position at 65, facing potential homelessness because of my own child's greed. How did my relationship with my son come to this? Update 1, it's been a month since my last post, and I can hardly believe how much has happened. The situation with Gary and Jane has only escalated, and I find myself in a position I never thought possible. After my initial post, I decided to take action. I couldn't just sit back and let Gary and Jane sell my home from under me. I reached out to an old friend, Dean, who's a lawyer. I've known Dean since college, and he's always been there for me. When I explained the situation, he was appalled and offered to help me pro bono. Dean looked into the legal aspects of my situation. It turns out that while Gary's name is on the deed, there are laws protecting me as a long-term resident. Dean explained that Gary couldn't just kick me out or sell the house without my consent. This gave me a small sense of relief, but I knew the battle was far from over. I decided to confront Gary and Jane. I invited them over for dinner, hoping that in a calm, familiar setting, we could have a rational discussion. I spent the whole day preparing Gary's favorite meal, pot roast with all the trimmings. It was the same meal I used to make for his birthday every year when he was growing up. When they arrived, we sat down to eat, and for a while, it was almost like old times. We made small talk about work and the weather. Finally, I decided it was time to address the elephant in the room. I told them about my conversation with Dean. I explained that what they were trying to do wasn't just morally wrong, but potentially illegal. I hoped that this information would make them reconsider their actions. Gary's reaction was not what I expected. Instead of backing down, he became angry. He accused me of threatening him, of trying to manipulate him with legal jargon I didn't understand. Jane chimed in, saying I was being selfish and standing in the way of their future. I tried to remain calm, to explain that I wasn't trying to threaten anyone. I just wanted to keep my home, the place where I'd raised Gary, where we'd made so many memories together. But my words seemed to fall on deaf ears. The dinner ended with Gary and Jane storming out, leaving me alone with a table full of half-eaten food. I spent that night going through old photo albums, looking at pictures of Gary growing up. I couldn't reconcile the smiling boy in those photos with the man who was now trying to take away my home. The next day, I received a letter from a law firm representing Gary and Jane. They were challenging my right to stay in the house, claiming that as co-owner, Gary had the right to sell. The letter was full of legal terms I didn't understand, but the message was clear, they were prepared to take this to court. I immediately called Dean. He reassured me, but warned me that legal battles can be long and draining, both emotionally and financially. He advised me to prepare for a tough fight. Over the next few weeks, my life became a full of legal consultations and paperwork. Dean was incredibly helpful, explaining everything in terms I could understand and guiding me through the process. But it was exhausting. I found myself losing sleep, constantly worried about what would happen next. During this time, I also started reaching out to old friends and colleagues. I hadn't realized how isolated I'd become in recent years, focusing all my energy on Gary and his family. It was a relief to reconnect with people who knew me, 
who remembered the kind of father I'd been to Gary. One of these friends, my former colleague Susan, offered to let me stay with her if things got really bad. It was comforting to know I had somewhere to go if the worst happened, but the thought of leaving my home still broke my heart. As the legal battle heated up, Gary and Jane's tactics became more aggressive. They started spreading rumors in the neighborhood that I was mentally unstable, that I needed to be in a care home. Some neighbors I'd known for years started avoiding me, giving me looks when we passed on the street. The stress was taking its toll on my health. I found myself feeling tired all the time, losing my appetite. My doctor warned me about the dangers of stress at my age and prescribed some medication to help me sleep. But pills couldn't fix the ache in my heart every time I thought about Gary. Update 2, it's been about 3 weeks since I made the last update, and I received an unexpected visitor. It was Jane's mother, Elizabeth. I'd only met her a handful of times at family events, and we'd never been close. She seemed uncomfortable as she stood on my doorstep, but I invited her in out of politeness. Over a cup of tea, Elizabeth revealed why she'd come. She'd overheard Gary and Jane discussing their plans, and she was horrified. She told me that she and her husband had no idea what Gary and Jane were doing, and they didn't approve. Elizabeth apologized for her daughter's behavior and offered to help in any way she could. After everything that had happened, it was hard to trust anyone connected to Gary and Jane. But as we talked, I could see that Elizabeth was genuinely upset by the situation. She shared stories about her own father, who had lived with them in his later years. She couldn't imagine treating a parent the way Gary and Jane were treating me. Before she left, Elizabeth handed me an envelope. Inside was a check for a substantial amount of money. She insisted I take it, saying it was to help with legal fees or whatever else I needed. I was overwhelmed by her generosity and tried to refuse, but she wouldn't hear of it. She made me promise to let her know if I needed anything else. It was reassuring to know that not everyone in Gary's new family approved of his actions. But it also made me sad to think that my son's in-laws were showing me more kindness than he was. The legal battle continued to drag on. Gary and Jane's lawyers were aggressive, throwing every legal argument they could think of at us. Dean was doing an excellent job defending me, but the constant back and forth was draining. One particularly difficult day, I found myself sitting in the backyard, looking at the old treehouse Gary and I had built together when he was 10. It was weathered and worn now, but still standing. I remembered the summer we spent building it, Gary's excitement as we hammered each nail, the pride in his eyes when we finally finished. Now, that same boy was trying to take away the home we'd shared so many happy memories in. As I sat there lost in thought, my phone buzzed with a text. It was from Gary, the first direct communication we'd had in weeks. The message was brief and cold, Dad, this is your last chance. Agree to sell the house and move in with us, or we'll make sure you end up with nothing. This wasn't the son I'd raised. The Gary I knew would never have threatened his own father like this. I didn't respond to the text, but I saved it. Dean had advised me to keep records of all communication from Gary and Jane. The next day, I had a scheduled meeting with Dean to discuss our strategy going forward. As I was getting ready to leave, I heard a commotion outside. I looked out the window to see Gary and Jane in the front yard, overseeing a group of workers who were setting up a for sale sign. I rushed outside, demanding to know what was going on. Gary said they were just preparing for the inevitable. I told them they had no right to put up a sign, that the house wasn't for sale. Jane laughed and said, it will be soon enough, old man. I stood there, watching helplessly as the workers finished setting up the sign. Neighbors were starting to come out of their houses, curious about the commotion. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept replaying the day's events in my mind, trying to understand how things had gone so wrong. I found myself thinking about Laura, wondering what she would say if she could see what our son had become. The next morning, I woke up to find my front yard full of people. Gary and Jane had organized an open house, without my knowledge or consent. Potential buyers were wandering through my home, examining my things as if I wasn't even there. I was furious. I called Dean immediately, and he advised me to document everything. So I started taking videos and photos of the people in my house, making sure to capture Gary and Jane's faces clearly. Some of the potential buyers looked uncomfortable when they realized I was the homeowner and that I hadn't authorized this open house. As the day went on, more and more people showed up. Gary and Jane were acting like gracious hosts, showing people around my home, pointing out features as if they had any right to sell it. I overheard Jane telling one couple that they were helping her poor, confused father-in-law transition to assisted living. The blatant lie made me extremely angry. I tried to talk to some of the potential buyers, to explain the situation, but Gary and Jane kept intercepting me, steering people away. At one point, I heard Gary tell someone that I was not quite right in the head. By the end of the day, I was exhausted and heartbroken. After the last potential buyer left, Gary and Jane stayed, clearly pleased with themselves. Gary had the audacity to tell me that the open house had been a big success, that they'd had several interested parties. He said I should start packing my things. I couldn't take it anymore. Years of pent-up frustration and hurt came pouring out. I told Gary exactly what I thought of him, of the selfish, greedy man he'd become. I reminded him of all the sacrifices I'd made, all the love I'd given him, 
I asked him how he could do this to me, to the memory of his mother. For a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of the old Gary in his eyes. But then Jane whispered something in his ear, and his expression hardened. He told me I was living in the past, that I needed to accept that things had changed. Then they left, leaving me alone in the house that no longer felt like a home. That night, I made a decision. I couldn't keep living like this, constantly on edge, waiting for the next thing to happen. I needed to take control of the situation. I called Dean and told him I wanted to take more aggressive legal action. He warned me that it could get ugly, that Gary and Jane might retaliate even more strongly. But I was past caring about that. I needed to fight for my home, for my dignity. The next few weeks were full of legal meetings and court appearances. Gary and Jane's lawyers threw everything they had at us, but Dean was brilliant. He presented evidence of their harassment, including the videos from the unauthorized open house. He argued about my rights as a long-term resident and co-owner of the property. Throughout it all, Gary and Jane sat in the courtroom, whispering to each other and their lawyers, barely even looking at me. It was like they didn't even see me as a person anymore, just an obstacle to be overcome. The stress of the legal battle was taking its toll on me. I lost weight, had trouble sleeping. My doctor was concerned about my blood pressure and stressed the importance of trying to stay calm. But how could I stay calm when my own son was trying to make me homeless? As the court case neared its conclusion, I received another surprise visit. This time, it was Jane's father, Robert. Like his wife, he seemed uncomfortable as he stood on my doorstep. I invited him in, curious about what had brought him here. Robert didn't beat around the bush. He told me he was ashamed of his daughter's behavior and disappointed in Gary. He said he and Elizabeth had raised Jane to be better than this, and he couldn't understand what had changed her. Then Robert did something I never expected. He offered to buy Gary and Jane out of their share of my house. He said he couldn't stand by and watch them destroy our family over money. I was stunned by his offer and didn't know how to respond. Robert assured me that this wasn't charity. He explained that he and Elizabeth had been planning to give Jane and Gary a substantial sum as a down payment on a new house anyway. Instead, they would use that money to buy out Gary's share of my house. This way, I could stay in my home, and Gary and Jane would still get the money they wanted. I was overwhelmed by Robert's generosity. It seemed too good to be true, a perfect solution to this nightmare. But I was also wary. I'd been hurt too many times in recent months to trust easily. I told Robert the first needed time to think about his offer and to discuss it with my lawyer. He understood and gave me his card, asking me to call him once I'd made a decision. The next morning, I called Dean and told him about Robert's offer. He advised me to proceed carefully. We agreed to set up a meeting with Robert to discuss the details. The meeting took place at Dean's office a few days later. Robert brought his own lawyer, and we spent hours going over the specifics of the proposal. By the end of the meeting, we had hammered out an agreement that seemed fair to everyone. Under the terms of the deal, Robert would buy out Gary's share of the house, giving him and Jane the money they wanted for their new home. In return, I would retain full ownership of my house. There were conditions, of course. I had to agree not to sell the house for at least five years, and if I did decide to sell after that, Gary and Jane would have first right of refusal. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it was better than I could have hoped for. I would get to keep my home, and Gary and Jane would get their money. Maybe, I thought, this would be the end of the conflict. I should have known better. When Gary and Jane found out about the deal, they were furious. They accused Robert and Elizabeth of interfering, of taking my side against their own daughter. Gary called me, ranting about how I'd turned his in-laws against him. I tried to explain that this was a good solution for everyone, that they were still getting what they wanted. But Gary wouldn't listen. He said I'd poisoned Jane's parents against them, that I was manipulating everyone. The conversation ended with Gary telling me he never wanted to see me again. He said as far as he was concerned, he no longer had a father. Those words cut deep, deeper than anything else that had happened. Despite Gary and Jane's objections, the deal went through. Robert bought out Gary's share of the house, and I became the sole owner. The legal proceedings were finally over. The for sale sign was removed from my front yard. In the weeks that followed, I tried to get back to normal. I started taking better care of myself, eating properly again, getting some exercise. I heard through the people that Gary and Jane had bought their dream house in the exclusive neighborhood they'd been eyeing. I wondered if they were happy, if the money and the big house were worth what they'd done to get them. As the months passed, I started to come to terms with everything. Final update, it's been quite a while, around two years, after the legal battle and everything with Jake ended, I received an unexpected package in the mail around six months after the drama. It was from Jane's parents, Robert and Elizabeth. Inside was a photo album and a letter. The letter explained that they'd been going through some old family photos and had come across several pictures of Gary from various family events over the years. They thought I might like to have them. It was a kind gesture, and I appreciated it more than I could express. The last page of the album held a surprise. It was a recent photo of Gary and Jane standing in front of a house, their new house, I assumed. Jane was holding a small sign that read baby on board. They were going to be parents. I sat there for a long time, staring at that photo.
I was going to be a grandfather. It was something I'd dreamed about for years, imagining teaching my grandchild to play catch or reading them bedtime stories. Now it was happening, but I wasn't sure I'd ever get to meet this grandchild. That night, I wrote a letter to Gary, got their address in the letter. I congratulated him on the baby and told him how happy I was for him. I said I understood if he didn't want me in his life, but that I hoped someday we might be able to reconcile. I told him I loved him, that I would always love him, no matter what. I mailed the letter the next day, not really expecting a response. Weeks passed, and I heard nothing. I tried to put it out of my mind, to focus on the good things in my life. But I couldn't help wondering about Gary and the baby. Then one morning, about eight months after I'd sent the letter, I was out front watering my flowers when a car pulled up. To my shock, Gary got out. He looked different, older, more serious. He stood there for a moment, just looking at me. Then, without a word, he walked up and hugged me. It was awkward at first. But then I felt him relax, and I hugged him back. We stood there for a moment, neither of us speaking. When we finally pulled apart, I could see tears in Gary's eyes. I'm sorry, Dad, he said I'm so, so sorry. We went inside, and over cups of coffee, Gary poured out his heart. He told me how ashamed he was of his behavior, how the stress of trying to fit into Jane's world had changed his priorities. He said becoming a father himself had made him realize how terribly he'd treated me. Gary explained that he and Jane had been going through some tough times. The pressure of the new house, the baby on the way, and the guilt over what they'd done to me had put a strain on their relationship. They'd started couples counseling, which had helped Gary see how far he'd strayed from the values I'd raised him with. I listened to Gary's apologies and explanations. As Gary talked, I could see the boy I'd raised, the kind, thoughtful son who'd been my best friend for so many years. But I could also see the changes in him. He was more mature now, more aware of the consequences of his actions. Gary told me about the baby, a little girl, due in just a few months. He said he and Jane had been doing a lot of thinking, and they wanted me to be a part of their child's life. I was touched by the offer, but I made it clear that things couldn't just go back to the way they were before. Too much had happened, too many hurtful things had been said and done. If we were going to have a relationship going forward, it needed to be on new terms. Gary understood. He suggested we start slow, maybe meeting for coffee once a week, gradually rebuilding our relationship. I agreed. As Gary was leaving, he hesitated at the door. Dad, he said, I know I have no right to ask this, but, would you consider being there when the baby is born? I'd really like my daughter to meet her grandfather. I was surprised by the request, and conflicted. I wanted nothing more than to be there for the birth of my granddaughter. But should I trust Gary and Jane? In the end, I told Gary I'd think about it. He nodded, understanding my hesitation. The next few months Gary and I met regularly for coffee, sometimes joined by Jane. These meetings were often awkward at first, with all of us dancing around the elephant in the room. But gradually, we started to relax around each other. Jane apologized for her part in what had happened. She explained that she'd been under a lot of pressure from her parents to marry up and provide a certain lifestyle. She'd gotten caught up in the materialism and lost sight of what really mattered. The pregnancy had been a wake-up call for her too. I appreciated Jane's apology, but like with Gary, I made it clear that rebuilding trust would take time. She seemed to understand and respected my boundaries. Two weeks before the due date, Gary called me in a panic. Jane had gone into labor early. They were on their way to the hospital. I didn't hesitate and met him at the hospital. The next few hours I paced the hospital waiting room. Gary came out periodically to give me updates. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Gary came out with a huge smile on his face. Dad, do you want to meet your granddaughter? I followed Gary into the room. Jane was in the bed, looking exhausted but happy. And there, in her arms, was the tiniest, most perfect little bundle I'd ever seen. Gary gently took the baby from Jane and brought her to me. Dad, meet Lily Laura, as I held my granddaughter for the first time. She was beautiful, and her middle name, Laura, my late wife's name. I looked at Gary, questioning. He smiled, and said we wanted her to have a piece of grandma, to honor the amazing parents who raised me. Over the next few months, I spent as much time as I could with Lily. Gary and Jane were wonderful about including me in her life. My relationship with Gary and Jane improved too. We talked more openly about what had happened, working through our issues. So that's it Reddit that's the story of the past two years I have gone through. I thank you for all the meaningful advice you guys have given me but now it's time for me to stop writing and enjoy whatever time I have with my family.